Welcome to the uh, Center for Public Leadership Roundtable. The Leadership Roundtable started four years ago with an initial grant from the University Provost Office, but uh, CPL has uh, kept it going since then, and um, in, uh, sometimes in, in co-sponsoring with other uh, centers and institutions. And this is a talk that's co-sponsored today between the Center for Public Leadership and the Women in Public Policy Program. So um, let me, I'd like to say a couple words of introduction Speaker. Linda Carley is an associate professor at Wellesley College. She wrote her uh, dissertation at UMass on uh, gender gender effects on influenceability, and she is now, um, I can safely say, the, the uh, leading scholar in psychology on gender and influence. She has written numerous articles on uh, topics such as uh, gender effects on social influence and emergent leadership gender nonverbal behavior and, and influence, gender language and influence, and um, she's done work on cognitive biases and the effect of hindsight on victim derogation. She's currently uh, working on a book with Alice Eagley on gender and leadership, so uh, please welcome her. Thank you. So today I'm going to be talking about gender communication and social influence, and I'm going to be looking at the intersection of gender, gender stereotyping, the way men and women communicate, and how that all affects how influential they are. Before I begin talking about those things, I first want to talk about the status of women as it's changed over time. <clears throat> we know that the status of women has improved in recent years. More women are working than in the past and more women are managers than in the past, many more women. Salaries have increased for women and the differential between male salaries and female salaries has shrunk dramatically. So this is all a vast improvement in women's status, but still, in spite of all of that, women continue to earn less than men. We have not reached parity. And women are relatively absent from the highest positions of power in almost every domain that you can think of. Business, military, uh, uh, law, medicine, and even education, which is the most feminine domain you can think of. Even in that domain, men are at the top and women are not. And I would argue that this reflects continued resistance to women's influence and authority and the persistence of gender stereotypes, which make it difficult for women to exert influence and place an extra burden on them that men do not have to worry about. Now, in particular, it is gender stereotypes that contribute to gender differences in communication and influence, and I'm going to be talking about gender stereotypes in part today. And I want to argue that the main theme of my, my talk will be that women exert less influence for two main reasons. Number one, because they're perceived to be less competent than men. And number two, because it's very important for men, for women, but not for men, to exert, to be likable in order to exert influence. So there's a double pressure that women have that men don't have. The need to prove one's competence and the need to be nice and warm and likable. <laughs> and these are not concerns that men have to deal with. Now being perceived as, as much, that's right. Being perceived as competent and being perceived as likable are both very important to social influence. And there's a vast literature on social influence that goes back for many years. And we know that competence and likableness both affect how influential you are. And you can see this even in advertising. I mean, advertisers exploit this notion when they make an advertisement. They'll often present the person pitching the item as highly competent or highly likable. So for example, if it's something like you know, a painkiller, they'll present the product on television being sold by a physician. It isn't really a physician, but someone who appears to be a physician, because physicians presumably are very competent and know about medicine and would exert greater influence. Or I'll, as an alternative, they might present somebody who is very similar to the audience and therefore very appealing to the audience, someone who would be very likable. So for example, selling domestic products, household products. They might imagine the typical person using dish soap might be a woman. And so they present as the influence agent a very likable person who's similar to this audience, um, a housewife, say. So we know that perceived competence and perceived likableness are important to social influence, and so those are two very important factors that affect women's influence and men's. But it's those two factors that are also particularly problematic for women, maintaining competence and likableness. 
So I would argue then that <clears throat> the issue of being influential and how one goes about exerting influence becomes more difficult for women than for men. So let's look at the stereotypes and see how these stereotypes relate to those two factors, um, competence and likability. We have lots and lots of research on stereotyping, cross-cultural research and so on, and there are lots of stereotypes about men and women, some of which are irrelevant to the current discussion. But you too, when you look at overall all this literature, you find a theme running through it, and the theme is that overall, in general, even cross-culturally, men are seen as more agentic than women, more leader-like, more assertive, more confident, more competent, more task competent, okay? And second, women are seen as more communal than men, nicer, kinder, warmer, more nurturing, so the stereotypes seem to be that male ha males have an advantage in the agency area of competence, and females have an advantage in the communality area of warmth and likability. So it seems to kind of wash out. But that, I don't think, is the case, that it actually washes out. <clears throat> like I said, there's a great deal of research on stereotyping where people are simply asked to describe what men and women are like, and that Men will be described as agentic and competent, and women as warm and likable. But there's also other research which underscores this, this stereotyping research and shows the, the stereotypes exist in a variety of different domains. So I want to talk a bit about that research as well. First, let's talk about male competence. Um, we know from a variety of different research paradigms that men are perceived to be more competent than women. So I'm going to start first with Swim's research, and she reviewed the Goldberg paradigm research, which basically looks at how men and women are evaluated in terms of the particular products or performances that they create. In the typical Goldberg paradigm study, you would have um, subjects responding to, say, an essay or a resume written by somebody. And they're presented with this essay or resume, say, or some other types of things like artwork. And they're asked to evaluate the particular item's quality. Um, what happens in the Goldberg Paradigm studies is that subjects are presented with identical items either ascribed to women or ascribed to men. So it's the identical item. The only thing that differs is either a man or a woman is supposed to have done it. And in this Goldberg Paradigm, what you see is that overall, when the items are attributed to men, they receive higher valuations than when they're attributed to women. It's not a big difference, it's a small difference, but it's a reliable difference. Okay, for both so, men and women? Yes, that's correct, for both men and women. The early Goldberg studies um, were actually done with women, started with women. So in that domain, evaluating products without any information about the person except the, um, whether they're male or female, there is a tendency for people to stereotype and see males as more competent. Another domain of, that demonstrates this is research on uh, attitudes about managerial ability. And this research has been done by Virginia Schein, uh, where she's actually studied around different countries in Europe, in Asia, the United States, and so on, asking people what, who would be the ideal manager. And according to what people say in every country that she studied, the ideal manager is a man and has masculine characteristics. So masculinity is linked with managerial <coughs> competence in this research. There's only one exception to this, and that is in the United States, females no longer ascribe to this stereotype. So there has been cultural change in the United States, which is great. Women now believe that a, man, a manager could be a man or a woman equally well. Okay? In all other countries that have been studied, women show the same stereotyping as men do, except for the United States. Um, however, across the board, what you do see is that men hold this stereotype more strongly than women do. It's true that everybody holds it, but it's more strongly held by men. Okay? And I think that's an important point, which I'm going to come back to again later on. About, yes? The, uh, with the research that grows out of the Goldberg paradigm, mm -hmm. um, it reminds me of research done by Todd Patinsky on uh, positive stereotypes. And it makes me wonder whether there are certain products that you know, the, the SWIM and Goldberg type findings true across all products, or are there certain products where people are actually likely to rate women higher because of the nature of the product? Let me see if I can remember if she had co-variation with type of product. But overall, there was the effect for everything. Okay. Across the board. Right, but there may have been there may have been mediating factors like art might have been not as bad as say a razor. Right. Um, okay. 
So in the shine literature then, you get this effect more strongly among men than you get among women. Next you can look at the research on evaluation of leaders, which Alice Eggley has done with many of her colleagues. In particularly her meta-analysis of evaluation of male and female leaders shows that men and women evaluate male leaders more favorably than female leaders. But again, men discriminate more. So the evaluations are more positive for, for men by everybody, but men more than women view men as better leaders. Okay? And then there are these experimental studies, and Biernat, Fasci, and a number of other people have done them, and basically what they do is they ask subjects to um, identify what would be needed to establish competence in somebody. How well would someone have to perform to be really considered competent? You know, would they have to get this many right, or they would have to do what exactly? And uh, what happens in this literature is that male and female subjects require higher standards of competence in women than in men to be considered comparably able. Okay, so when women complain, you know, they have to work harder, the research seems to suggest, in fact, that they do in order to get the same evaluation as men. And finally, related to this, um, in some of my research, it's a kind of, I haven't written this up yet, and I'm still not sure what to make of it, but I have revealed in adults, it says adults, but actually in ch children too, uh, that um, people evaluate themselves more favorably after interacting with women than interacting with men. Mm -hmm. And there may be something about the nature of interaction with women. Either you feel confident because women are not as smart as you, or women generally are not as confident, or there's something about the nature of the interaction, but people feel more confident in their behavior after interacting with women. And this is true of preschool boys and girls. But boys, I'm sorry, not girls. Boys feel puffed up after interacting with little girls. <laughs> um, actual performance is not affected. It's just your perception of your performance is better after interacting with females. So it appears that across a variety of different types of studies and paradigms that, yes, there was evidence that men are perceived to be more competent than women. What about research on female warmth? This is the era where women are, in fact, advantaged, right? Women are, men, are, men are more competent, women are more warm and likable. In fact, um, research suggests that women are, <laughs> overall, seen very favorably. And this has been coined by Edmund Ladnick as the women are wonderful effect. Women are kind, women are good, women are nurturing, women are gentle, women are sensitive, women are nurturing. And these are all wonderful qualities and people ascribe to women and they think they're fabulous and probably more important than other qualities. And so overall, women get very high ratings. Okay, and this sounds really good and this might provide women with an advantage in terms of social influence. Unfortunately, there seems to be a double-edged sword about this warmth business, and it creates a problem for women. For example, Fisk, who does research on stereotyping, has found that women are nice, except for professional women, who are not nice at all. They're not very likable. They're cold, they're mean, you know? The kind of Martha Stewart-esque effect. You know, they are Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton, exactly. All this discussion about Hillary, she's, you know, not as appealing. And Hyland's research on evaluation of, of um, competence in women, she's found that women are very likable unless they're very competent. You can be too competent, apparently, <coughs> as a woman. And so what this suggests is that very professional, very competent women are seen as not very likable. Somehow in women, competence and agency seem con to conflict with or contradict the warmth and be in opposition to it. And I would say what's actually going on is that it's not so much that women are not perceived generally to be nice, but that this niceness description of women has become a prescription. Women have to be nice. It's not enough that women are nice, they have to be nice. And so we have a prescription of female warmth. That men don't have a prescription of male warmth. They can you know, be nice or not. It's wonderful if they are, but they don't have to be. But there's a prescription of female warmth, and that means that if there's any sign that a woman isn't warm, she's apparently too agentic, too assertive, too professional, then she gets into trouble and is not likable. And of course, this creates a very serious double bind for women. Because on one hand, women have to demonstrate that they're competent in, in order to be influential and effective. But if you're very, very competent as a woman, you might be seen as lacking warmth, 
Which lowers your likability. Your likability. And both of them that competence are needed for influence. So what are you to do? I mean, it is a problem, either one or the other, and they conflict in a way that they don't for men. But one would argue that this would create problems for women's influence, that they're not going to be as effective influence agents as men are because either their competence or likableness would be in question. And in fact, we have research showing that that's the case. Lots of studies on women and, and gender differences in influence by Ridgway, Wood, and others have shown that, have shown that in interactions in groups, for example, uh, men exert greater influence than women do. Okay. Men also more often emerge as leaders in groups, which is another index of this. A particularly interesting study by Prop looked at um, how people respond to information presented in a group by men or women. And what Prop did is she had subjects discussing, engaging in a group discussion where they had to come to consensus. And she had groups of two men or two women. Sometimes she would, she would have a special piece of information that she would give to somebody in the group. That, and that person would be told, tell the group this. It's very important to the decision. Um, and what happened in the research is that when a man was told to introduce the information, and he did, the group used it. Almost always. When a woman was given the information and she introduced it, the most common response was simply to ignore it. Okay, this is, an, I think, a living example of lack of influence. In fact, men contributing the very same idea were six times more likely to influence the group than were women. So it's very clear that there is a problem in exerting influence because of the pressures that women experience. So I said at the beginning that I was going to be talking about communication. So how does communication relate to all of this? What is the relation of communication to influence? And I would say that communication is important because communication is a means by which somebody can communicate that they're competent or communicate that they're likable. The way you behave, the style of your interaction, the way you communicate can be cues to people as to whether you're a competent individual or a likable individual or both. Okay? So communication can then affect how influential we are and the way we communicate. It can affect our likableness and perceived competence. So let's look at gender differences in communication. Now you'll see that the gender differences I'm going to describe in communication tend to fall along the same the lines of the stereotypes that I've already discussed. Overall, male communication appears to be more agentic than female communication, more self-assertive, more dominant. For example, Anderson and Leeper recently meta-analyzed interruptions. Um, and there are all kinds of interruptions, interruptions for all sorts of purposes, but overall men interrupt more, and they particularly interrupt more um, in, with intrusive interruptions. And intrusive interruptions are interruptions that are designed to gain the floor, to take over the conversation and gain the floor. So men particularly engage in that kind of interruption more than women do. And that is clearly a sign of self-assertion and agency, to take over the floor, to be in charge. Another gender difference which manifests greater male agency is research by DeVidio on visual dominance. Visual dominance has to do with where you look when you're talking or where you look when you're speaking. So a highly visually dominant person, when they're talking, would actually look someone in the eye. So if I'm talking right now and I'm talking to you, I would be look, gazing steadfastly at you while I'm talking, which doesn't this feel odd? It's a little strange, right? That's very, very dominant behavior. <laughs> um, and when I'm listening to you speaking, a visually dominant person would look away while you're speaking. So looking while speaking, looking away while listening, that's visual dominance. And the reverse is low visual dominance, which I think we're more familiar with, which is when I'm talking, I cut my eyes roam around the room, you know, you can see that they are. And when I'm listening to somebody, I look at the person I'm listening to, you're all looking at me, okay? So that would be the more typical thing. So the more you look while speaking and look away while listening, the more visually dominant you are. Men are more visually dominant than women. Now there are cross-cultural differences in visual dominance, um, and there are contextual differences too. For example, that people are more visually dominant when they're in, in a domain where they're very expert, or very, where they're leaders visually dominant. But that only uh, supports the argument that generally men feel like leaders and then feel like they're in charge and they know more because they're showing the behavior of leaders and highly competent um, leader-like people. 
So we have, again, further evidence of greater male agency here in communication style. Uh, James and Drakich reviewed the gender differences in total talk. <coughs> and again, the amount that which people talk is associated with being perceived as competent and leader-like. And people who actually do have high status do get an opportunity to speak more than those who are low status. Um, research shows that in a variety of different domains, actually every domain that was studied by them, um, men talk more than women. Now it is the case that there is some variation across domain. There are moderator effects. So for example, men are particularly more likely to talk than women in public settings and professional se uh, domains. So in a setting like this, this would be a setting where men would typically talk more than women. And the smallest gender difference occurs in the home, private conversation. Okay, but again, you see greater male agency, self-assertion, and amount of talk. And then I meta-analyzed gender difference, gender difference research in um, amount of task behaviors and disagreements in groups. And task behaviors are behaviors that are directed to getting the task done, such as making suggestions, giving directions, orienting the group, telling people how to proceed. Those are task behaviors. And disagreements are expressing disagreement with someone in a group setting. Disagreements are actually pretty unusual. They don't occur very often. It would be someone saying, no, you're wrong, or I disagree in an overt manner. It doesn't, hap doesn't happen very often. But men do it more than women do. So across all this literature, you see that males exhibit greater agency in their communication style, which is in fact consistent with the stereotypes as we've described them. What about female communality? Well, in fact, women's communications are more communal than men's. So for example, I also meta-analyzed group process studies looking at positive social behaviors. And those are behaviors that make the group feel happy and maintain social harmony in the group. For example, complimenting somebody or agreeing with somebody or expressing support for another point of view, saying to someone, gee, that's really smart. I'm glad you're, you expressed that, something like that. So kind of positive social interaction in the group. Women engage in positive social behavior more than men do in group interaction. Uh, Marianne LaFrance has recently meta-analyzed gender differences in smiling, and smiling is another form of communal behavior. It uh, lubricates interactions, and it makes everybody happy. Uh, women across every domain examined smile more than men. Yeah, it's a very reliable finding. This is not the first time it's been reviewed or meta-analyzed, and it's always the same. Women smile more. Um, <clears throat> in leadership style, Aigley and her colleagues have meta-analyzed that literature, and they found, for example, that women are more communal as leaders as well. Women leaders are more likely to lead in a democratic manner than are male leaders, who are more likely to lead in an autocratic manner. Now, clearly, dem democratic leadership style is very communal. It involves subordinates in decision-making. It um, is very attentive to the needs of subordinates. It's very interactive. Autocratic leadership is very detached, independent, you don't inform your subordinates of things. So it's very agentic. So again, we see here in leadership style, greater communality among women leaders and greater agency among male leaders. And finally, um, there's research looking at communication style, actual language that people use in interactions. And this literature, again, is very large. There's all kinds of things people look at, looking at language. Um, like use of pronouns and things like that. But specifically focusing on um, what I focused on and what a number of researchers have focused on is the use of mitigated language, which is language that appears uncertain or tentative. And mitigated language would involve using expressions such as maybe, sort of. It's sort of beautiful day. Isn't it? Isn't it? <laughs> now if I were to add a tag question, isn't it? Yeah. Or if I were to use questioning intonation, it's a beautiful day? That would make me appear less certain, less direct. So the use of maybe, sort of, these hedges, the use of tag questions, questioning intonation, or even self-disclaiming, such as saying something like, well, you know, I'm not an expert on the weather, but it seems to be a pretty nice day. So disclaiming expertise. 
And we have found, that myself and other researchers, that women are more likely to use these more mitigated forms of speech than men are. And in fact, although one could argue that this is not, you know, this might be a sign of deference or something like that, one could also show that mitigated speech is perceived as and often used as a form of communal speech. Engaging the other, connecting with the other, not wanting to push people around, wanting to engage. So again, another sign of communality in women. So what is the relation of communication to influence? How would they relate? Well, one could argue that if men are already presumed to be competent, and you know, they don't have to prove, make themselves likable, they should have a lot of latitude in how they behave and still be influential. They should get away with a lot. They should be able to be, behave however they want and still be effective. Women, on the other hand, should have more difficulty because their influence would depend more on their ability to establish both agency and communality. So it would be more difficult for them. And their behavior would, and their influence would be more directly related to their actual behavior and interactions. Okay? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to describe a series of studies that demonstrate this very thing. I'm going to start with one looking at tentative speech. Now in this study, I was interested to see if the use of tentative speech would um, would affect men's and women's influence in group interactions. And what I did, this research was involving undergraduates. And like all of my studies in which I measure social influence directly, I always pit the subject, uh, present the subject with someone who disagrees with them on some topic. And you have to be very careful in selecting your topic because it has to be a topic when you're doing gender research that doesn't favor male interest, knowledge, or opinion. There's no difference between men and women initially. And it has to be something that people actually have some interest in. So in this study, the subjects um, were presented with someone who disagreed with them on the topic of the free bus system. In this particular institution, they had a free bus system where they could get on the bus, they get off the bus, and ride all over the place in the city and the towns and other towns without charge. Now actually, there was a charge. Part of the student fees were paying for this. And as well, there was a charge in the community for this. But from the student's point of view, they would get on and off for free. And that they really valued. We argued in this message that it was a terrible thing not to have to pay every time you get on the bus, and that people should have to pay. The buses would be cleaner, the buses would be safer, student fees would drop. We had all kinds of arguments. So what we did was we presented subjects with what, was, what they were told was a person in the street interview about the bus system. We didn't, it wasn't actually that. It was um, a confederate who was performing being a person in the street, two confederates male or female. And what we did was we present, we asked the Confederate in the street with ambient car noises and everything else, you know, what do you think about the free bus system? And the Confederate's a terrible thing, terrible thing. We should be charged a fee every time we ride the bus and gave all the arguments. The persuasive message was the same for men and women who presented it. Okay, it was identical message. In addition, half of the communications by the males and females were assertive and half were tentative. And the assertive communications were just your typical common speech, fairly rapid rate of speech, not a lot of stumbling over words, and no additions of hesitations or tentative language. In the tentative condition, we had the same exact speech, but we added hedges, disclaimers, uh, questioning intonation, and tag questions to the same exact message. After listening to the subjects, rated the speaker's competence and likableness, and then gave their subsequent opinion on the topic of the free bus system. The results reveal that there, in fact, were interactions between uh, of, of language and gender on perceived competence. As I expected, male speakers overall were rated to be more competent than female speakers. That's just a general main effect for gender of speaker. And they were also rated as equally competent regardless of how they spoke. So in fact, whether a man spoke in a tentative manner or a direct manner had no effect on his ratings of competence. Okay? On the other hand, female speakers were rated as more competent when speaking assertively than when speaking tentatively. So it mattered for women, but it didn't matter for men. Men could do it whatever they wanted because of the presumption of male competence.
There were also interactions of gender and language on perceived likableness. Male speakers were rated as equally likable, no matter how they spoke. So whether they were tentative or not, they were perfectly likable people. Female speakers, on the other hand, who spoke assertively were less likable by men compared with the tentative female speaker. So women didn't have a problem with um, women speaking in a tent an assertive manner. Women rated females as equally likable no matter how they spoke. But men did. And they preferred the woman who was tentative to the woman who was assertive. They liked her more. And what was the effect on influence? Well, again, there was an interaction of gender and language on influence. Male speakers, unsurprisingly, were equally influential no matter how they communicated. Female speakers, on the other hand, who spoke assertively, were more influential with women, not surprising, right, because the assertive speech was perceived as more competent, enhanced their competence, but they were less influential with men because the men didn't like them. Now, what's interesting here is that the men rated the assertive female speaker as more competent but less likable. So what wins out in this is likableness for men. In other words, they're more persuaded by a woman they consider not very competent but very likable than a woman who's the reverse. Okay? All right. Women's assertive behavior did increase perception of their competence, but this, in fact, from, with male audience, undermined her likableness. This is the double bind that I was talking about. So it does create a problem, clearly, for women. Well, here, that was a situation where you just had competence, which is pretty benign. And I thought, well, competence is a problem, evidently. But what if you really had something more strongly agentic, like dominance? I mean, it would go beyond competence. You're going to go to dominance. What happens then? So in this next study, what I did was I actually trained Confederates to be more disagreeable, <laughs> sometimes. So subjects were interacting face to face in this study with a Confederate who disagreed with them on the topic. And this is, again, these were undergraduate students, and the topic was, should men be allowed in women's dorms after 10 PM? And students typically overwhelmingly agree with this. And so our Confederates argued that it's a terrible thing for men to be allowed in women's dorms after 10 PM. The subjects would listen to the Confederate. They had an ongoing discussion. The persuasive arguments, in fact, in all cases were the same. We came up with a set of arguments for our Confederates. They always used the same arguments. So the content of the argument is the same. We had male and female Confederates, and they either argued in a generally positive way, with no disagreement, or they would overtly disagree. And that we didn't have them do excessive amounts of disagreement, because I said at the beginning, a disagreement's a pretty unusual thing in group interactions, particularly direct overt disagreement. You're wrong. I disagree. That doesn't happen very often. So we just a little bit of that within the discussion that we had in one condition, which is the, um, the dominant disagreement condition. In addition to this having them interact, we, I videotaped them while they were interacting. Because one thing I wanted to see was how the subject would respond to someone who disagreed. What are they going to say? What are they going to do to this? How do they respond? And do they respond differently to men and women? Our participants then, when it was all over, rated the speaker's competence and likableness, and then gave their subsequent opinion on the topic of men and women's dorms. Again, male speakers were rated as more competent than female speakers overall. Always get this effect. And male speakers were rated as equally like, likable, regardless of whether they disagreed or not. But female speakers who overtly disagreed were rated as less likable by both men and women. So whereas women were very tolerant of competence in women, they didn't like a woman who disagreed. That was too much. And they didn't, they didn't respond well to her. Looking at the tapes, how did the subjects respond? Coding how the subjects communicated would be that participants behaved exactly the same to the male speaker regardless of how he communicated. So they said the same things, they behaved the same way, whether he disagreed or not. The participants expressed more disagreement and more negative social behavior to a disagreeing female than to one who agreed. Negative social behavior are things like anger, frustration, rejection, 
contempt, unpleasant, negative things. <clears throat> so they were actually directly, she would disagree with you, them, they would disagree back with her. And then they would have all this kind of contemptuous, hostile reactions to her. In terms of influence, participants were equally influenced by male speakers regardless of how the men spoke, but less influenced by women who disagreed than those who did not, which makes sense given their response. Influence, in addition, was correlated with ratings of likableness for women, but not for men. So again, this is the prescription. Women have to be nice, women have to be likable, but men don't in order to be influential. So then I thought, well, okay, we know that women are tolerant of confidence, but not disagreement. What about self-promotion? You know, if you want to be perceived as effective and you want to, let's say, get a job or get a promotion or get, um, get a raise, you might have to go and make your case, right? You might have to self-promote a little bit. So the question I asked in this study was, what happens with self-promoting versus modest behavior in speech? And this particular study was done at Wellesley. And I just want to say, you know, at Wellesley, if there's any environment that endorses female agency, it's at Wellesley. They endorsed it. They are it, you know. They believe they're going to be female leaders of the future. So this is a place that supports agency in women. But here we're looking at a particular form of agency, self-promotion, and how do they respond to that. What I presented with my, my subjects with was an um, application for an academic award. It was a written application, and we told subjects that this applicant was trying to get a monetary prize and that the, they were being evaluated on their past accomplishments of all kinds, personal, academic, athletic um, work. And so we wrote up this application, presumably by a female and male, or male student, and it was identical in all cases, except in one case, the same accomplishments were described relatively modestly, and in another case, rather than relatively immodestly. So for example, one of the things they had done is worked at a home for the elderly, and in the modest presentation, they would say, you know, when I left, it was, we all felt touched and I was moved by the, re the response of the, of the residents. In the immodest condition, it was when they left, when I left, I could see tears in their eyes as I was walking out the door. So it was relatively immodest. Um, a description of their athletic accomplishment in one case was, we were, I worked together with my team to win the state championship. And in the immodest one, it was, I inspired my team to go forward and win the state's championship. So, one more modest than the other. Participants read this description and they had to decide whether or not this person was deserving of an academic award or not. And they rated also the personality characteristics of the applicant. Male applicants receive comparable ratings regardless of whether they communicated in a self-promoting or modest fashion. So it didn't really matter in how the men were evaluated. Females were rated as more competent in the self-promoting condition. So self-promotion does enhance comp perceived competence, as one might expect. But they were more likable in the modest condition. So it increased perceived competence but lowered likability. As a result, male applicants exerted greater influence in both conditions because in one condition, when the women were self-promoting, they weren't likable, that undermined their influence, and the other condition where they were not self-promoting, they were less perceived as less competent, which undermined their influence. So overall, even though we had a very progressive group of, group of subjects who endorsed female agency, they weren't tolerant of female self-promotion. So in this next study, I thought, well, is there anything a woman can do? What can you do <laughs> to overcome this problem and get around the double bind? What a problem it is. So I thought, well, maybe you can be both warm and competent at the same time, which is a little bit difficult, but maybe there is a way. And so what I did was I, again, hired confederates um, who were going to engage in persuasive message uh, with my subjects. In this case, it was whether subjects should pay for the meals they eat only the meals they eat, or should they all pay for a meal plan generally? Subjects at this particular institution wanted to only pay for the meals they ate, have freedom. You know, you go in, you get the meal, you pay for it. You don't want to have to pay for the whole meal plan where some things might not be tasty and you don't want to eat them. So we argued they should pay for everything. 
Um, and we presented our Confederates who were male and female either as very competent alone, merely competent, or competent plus communal. And the merely competent speaker had a very erect posture, spoke very rapidly because rapid speech is associated with perceived competence, did not stumble over words, did not hesitate, maintained fairly regular, steadfast eye contact, um, used minimal hand gestures, and they were always rather restrained. Um, the communal plus competent had the same kind of speech, a little bit less fast, but a leaning forward body, lots of smiles, and head nods. <laughs> So head nodding, smiling, and forward lean, those are signs of interpersonal warmth and engagement. So that, we have those two conditions. So you've got this, you've got this really kind of um, competent verbalizations combined with nonverbal <coughs> going on. So the participants observed this, and then, then they gave their opinion of the topic, and they rated the speakers on how competent, likable, and threatening they were. So I added threat in the study. I had male and female subjects in this study. Again, male speakers were rated as more competent than female speakers, and they were rated equally on all the variables across the board, regardless of how they communicated. You know, the equal in likability, warmth, and threat. Could you say a bit more about threat? Yes. Uh, actually, I had several measures of threat, like how threatening is this person, how intimidating is this person, how, oh, let's see, threat, intimidating, there's another one. So that men, I don't, in terms of the overall mean for men, that moderate threat, not high threat. But what gestures were helping you? Okay, um, well, I didn't say this because it's not the focus of this paper, but I also, of, of this talk, but I also had other conditions which were more extremely dominant like yelling, pointing, and frowning, and making the eyebrows go down, and all this other stuff. And so I also wanted to look at, you know, what happens if you, remember the one study I mentioned about disagreement? It was modest. This was like over the top dominant. And I did that because I said, is there a point at which even men will be penalized? <laughs> and they were in, in that. And they, that was a very threatening by everybody. Nobody liked that. <laughs> Nobody wants to be yelled at and pointed at and stuff. <clears throat> Men were less persuaded by female speakers and rated female speakers as less likable and more threatening when they were merely competent than they, when they were communal plus competent. Okay? So here you have a woman who's competent and she's rated as not very likable and, and threatening. She's threatening. So, and that, of course, undermines her influence with men. Women rated female speakers equally on all variables and were equally persuaded regardless of, what, of her language, being warmer and competent or merely competent. And again, likableness predicted influence for female speakers but not for men. Okay, so we have a pretty clear picture of the same kind of findings over and over again with uh, adults. And I thought, well, what's, what, let's go back to really early childhood here and see how young can you go and get these effects. So on the campus at Wellesley, we have a child study center, and we have children there, two, three, and two, three, four, and five years old. The two is a little hard. They're not that verbal. But three, they're pretty verbal. And so for three, four, and five-year-olds, we decided to go and look and see how they respond to male and female agency and more. So in this first study, we're looking at social influence here. We had the children in the preschool, 16 male and 16 female, preschool children, three, four, and five years of age, are evaluating the behavior of puppets. Now, um, one of the things I thought of was, you know, in all the other studies we have Confederates, and we just could not get a, fem a three year old or four year old Confederate to perform <laughs> to task, okay? So, <laughs> so we use puppets. Um, and our puppets. Um, basically would play the role. And it's interesting, you could say to the child, would you like to have lunch with Tommy Puppet? And they would say, love it or not. You know, so we could get a measure of how much they liked the puppet, or how much they wanted to go to lunch, how much they wanted to play on the playground with the puppet, how much they would sit next to the puppet, and how much they liked the puppet. So the puppets would be presented to them as exhibiting either agentic or communal behavior. And these behaviors are all very positive behaviors. So these are not like domineering behaviors. 
We have male and female children responding to male and female puppets. And in this study, they, they, the puppets were interacting with a gender neutral creature, which is basically just a styrofoam ball with antennae, eyes, nose, and mouth. No determined gender. It, and the name of this creature was Um. So let me give you a little scenario of what they would hear in, in, in responding to the puppets. So they would have male or female puppets interacting with um. And here's the example of nurturing, which is a communal behavior. John is on the playground. John's friend um is swinging on the swing. Um falls off the swing and starts to cry, and then you make um cry. John runs to um and gives um a big hug. John then goes and gets a band-aid and some tissues from the teacher. John goes to Um and says, don't worry, Um, I'll take care of you. I'll make sure you feel better. Um says, I am feeling better. <laughs> John sits with Um and keeps Um company until Um is ready to play again. Nurturance, okay, that's an example of nurturance. Here's an example of uh, agentic behavior. This is leadership. Megan, uh, Megan and Um's class is playing a game outside. The teacher has given them a list of things to find in the playground. The team that can find the most things will win a prize. Megan and Um are on a team together. Each team has, a lead, has to have a leader. Megan says, I will be the leader. I am good at taking charge. Um says, it doesn't, it doesn't mind. And Megan becomes the leader. So we had versions with the males and the females doing, uh, you know, ag agentic and communal behaviors. Okay, so what happened? There was equal liking for the male puppet regardless of how it behaved, and this was true by male and female children. Equal liking of, liking of the female puppet by girls regardless of its behavior. But there was a preference for the communal over the agentic female puppet by boys. Okay, so these are three, four, and five-year-olds, and the boys are already showing the effect. It was amazing to me. This was a multi-way interaction. I was almost fainted. <clears throat> so then I thought, let's do an influence study. <laughs> Why not? Um, with preschoolers. In this particular study, I asked, I presented the children with gender-neutral toys, because I wanted to make sure I controlled for gender typing. And um, in this interaction, the children looked at two puppets interacting together, talking together. And in this interaction, one puppet is trying to influence the other puppet. And we had all possible combinations. Boy puppets interacting, girl puppets, male trying to influence female, female trying to influence a male. So the children would watch the interaction, and then at the end we would say, what's going to happen? Is the puppet asking this request going to get its way? It's going to happen. So we had agentic influence attempts and communal ones. So an example of an agentic one would be a direct demand or request. This is Jacob. This is Jack Zachary. Jacob is playing with tape. Zachary says, give me the tape. I want it. What do you think Jacob will do? Will he say yes or no? And this is a um, more communal approach. Uh, this is praise. <laughs> this is Erica and this is Lindsay. Erica and Lindsay are deciding whether to play with markers or Play-Doh. Erica says, let's play with Play-Doh. Lindsay responds, but you're really good at playing with markers, so let's play with markers, OK? <laughs> what do you think Erica will do? <laughs> So the children listen to this. They see this thing's performed for them. Um, oops, I got the other one. Sorry. <laughs> is this a within or between condition? This particular one is a repeated measure. So every child gets to see all. We had many different puppets that they saw perform many different skits. So each child gets to see all possible permutations. Equal liking was found for the male puppet regardless of its behavior. No, I've got the wrong one, I'm sorry. Sorry. Communal children rated, children rated communal influence overall is more effective. So the children actually preferred the communal style of influence generally, which was interesting and not terribly surprising. They're more 
overt in their, you know, they like nice people, <laughs> and they very overtly expressed that. But what was particularly interesting was the multi-way interaction. Boys considered female puppets using agentic language to be particularly ineffective when they were interacting with male puppets. <laughs> Which is a fairly, I think, sophisticated nuance for them. I mean, these are pretty small children, okay? Um, and I want to say that understanding who these children are, these are the children of Wellesley faculty and Wellesley community people. So they're pretty much well-educated, privileged, advantaged children. I think probably children who would not necessarily be the strongest endorsers of gender stereotyping. So it's interesting that you get these effects. Okay, so in conclusion, Men are free to exhibit a wider range of behavior and still remain influential. They have a large latitude behaviorally of what they can do. Women are held to a higher standard of competence than men in order to exert influence. So they have to prove their competence. In addition, communicating in an agentic manner increases women's perceived competence, but it has the problem of undermining female likability. This apparently is true whether you're an adult woman or a female child or a female puppet. Female influence depends more on likability than male influence does. And as a result, women must combine exceptional displays of competence with warmth and communality in order to, in order to overcome the double blind and exert influence. That's it. Well, you know, I, this was the second time I've gone with the children, and so I should have been totally astonished, but that you could get a four-way interaction <laughs> that imitated adult four-way interactions. Or pre foreshadowed. Foreshadowed it, but that it was the same effect in three and four-year-olds so that you got. So were astonished at the, did, I, I, I guess I want to tease out the nature-nurture issue. Right. Did, were you saying to yourself, oh my god, this may be more nature than I thought? No, I'm not. My dream, what I would really like to do next, is I would like to do, uh, look at different ethnic groups. Now, in the Child Study Center, there are people of different ethnic groups, but they're rather few. And, and they're also like socially this upper class kind of community. It's not really diverse enough. Um, what we know is, for example, that if you look at the adult uh, stereotyping literature, that there are differences in different ethnic groups as to how much people endorse stereotypes. It has to do with the gender difference in status in income and, and professionalism. So for example, among African Americans in the United States, they have the smallest gender difference in salary. They have the smallest gender difference in status in work. They also hold many fewer gender stereotypes. It is not true about Africans in Africa. It's true about African Americans. So when you look at the differential, you should be able to match the differential in income and status with the differential in stereotyping. And you should be able to get that same effect with the children. So what I would like to do, it would be great fun, to have a, a sample of inner city black children. It would be great. Um, and then you know, look at Asian Americans where the differential is greater, or Hispanic Americans where it's greater. Then maybe replicate this in other countries where the disparity is even greater still. So your speculation is that whatever is going on as far as uh, nurture goes, right. it is happening at an extremely early age. Yes. That's right. That's right. I. That's what I believe. I mean, I think they're little replications of their, you know, their their culture. I think they're so socialized already at three. I don't think you can avoid it. You know, there they are. They are just amazingly socialized, and they they are probably going to reflect whatever values their parents had. And I didn't have access to the parents, unfortunately, and I wouldn't get it. Not well, interestingly, interested. you also made the point that this is a very particular population. Oh yeah. Presumably, would have much lower than. Gender stereotypes. I would think and so. And yet you're still speculating that this is yes. uh, nurture and not That's right. That's right. Partly, I, one of the things I wasn't able to do was to find out, and this is just a very interesting aside, 
the people who come, the children who come from Wellesley faculty, I think would be different than the children who come from the community. In the community, you have a lot more stay-at-home mom types. Wellesley faculty is sort of a mixed bag. It depends on who the faculty member is. If it's the child of a mother who's teaching, that's probably not very traditional. If it's the child of the father who's teaching, it may or may not be. You know, it varies. The fact that they are at Wellesley, there's a sort of progressive ethos. You know, everybody's very progressive at Wellesley in the, the college. I don't know about the community as much, um, but I could. I didn't have access to the parents. I don't know. Yeah. Hi, let me, uh, if I may, make a typical female statement. I'm not an expert in this area. Okay. Uh, <laughs> as I was listening to you, I was substituting estrogen and testosterone for all of your male-female mm -hmm. uh, differentiations and trying to think how far back you go uh, in terms of using this as a baseline. First, I thought the children's experiments were ingenious. Those were wonderful. Uh, and to think about how the behavior reflects biology in that way, and then the potential to measure from that assumption of really measuring what estrogen inputs are in testosterone. I remember Dan Bell, who was a sociologist when I was a student, saying if you inject 10 milligrams of testosterone into any white mouse, you're going to see amazing differences in behavior. Mm -hmm. And I think some of the things you're picking up there, yes, there are cultural variations, but there's a baseline from which you might want to measure some of that. And the other thing that hasn't come through, I think, in some of what I was listening to using my own very primitive measure of testosterone and estrogen, was the fears of castration in men and how some of this, again, could be interpolated based on that. Uh, recently, Hillary Clinton spoke, and people, men in the audience, were going like this, and I didn't know what it meant and it meant castrating. And my response was, not by Hillary, clearly, but uh, she was seen as a castrating woman. Right. And that's as primitive as you can get. And I think some of the very sophisticated work that you're doing right. overlays some biology. We want to know a little bit more so that we can get a better handle on how one then measures the culture. You know, like a three-year-old understanding that a girl puppet interacting with a boy puppet is different than a girl puppet interacting with a girl puppet, and there's not really logical hormonal things going on yet. Um, or men under certain conditions, let me just give you an aside, an interesting study looking at under what conditions are men willing to go along with a competent woman? Are there any conditions? Well, you know they are if they're likely to benefit. So if you place them in a situation, make it very clear, you've got, you can work with this rather really competent woman or this less competent woman or some, a man of moderate competence. They'll pick the man, usually. And then if you say, well, you know what? Whoever you work with has the potential of helping you gain a lot of money. <laughs> you pick the person, it's up to you. They find this very competent woman is suddenly so attractive, OK? Because she has the potential to make them gain something. Women are less likely to respond on those bases mm -hmm. than men are. The men are much more pragmatic. So I think it's, yeah, I agree with you. I think it's very very complex and very contextual, much more than the level of the hormones, I think, even. Oh, yeah, I didn't, sorry, I didn't mean to say that it was no, no, I, I wanted, hormonal, you know. because I think one of the things we've seen is that within the male population and within female population, there is an overlap in the oh, distribution, yes. both of behavior and oh, yes. uh, hormones, so that and we're not talking too. about a given, you know. Oh, and this too, there's overlap. Right. But these are mean differences. I actually want to go back to a question I have about sure. your, your last uh, conclusion with regards to children, which I thought you said that both boys and girls prefer communal behavior. Overall. Overall for both boys and girls. It was just like a male main effect. Male yep. But with adults, my understanding was that men preferred confidence in men and communal behavior in women. So that there were there were differences. Well, no, no, men about, could do anything. Uh, men men could, could do, do anything, anything, but what did they prefer in others? In others um, they like the competent men and the warm men equally well. Your, they could your do example anything. of agentic, though, with the kids was a, a particularly aversive version of agentic, which was, I want that marker, give it to me. Right, that was the it, more dominant. It, it, it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't. Um, it was very. You, yeah. you, could have, you could have invented a, a version of agentic which wasn't quite so aversive. That's right. We actually had multiple, we had some, they vary in degree. Some of them are dominant, and some are less dominant. So there's a there's a degree there. Um, 
but the tendency is for the boys if they they don't like directness, they don't like dominancy girls. Okay, so it's so really, yeah. Um, I have to admit, I, I'm watching my career flash. <laughs> Aren't we all, dear? <laughs> yes, we all. And, and, um, we saw the women. And no. I mean, I, in a previous life, I worked in a diesel engine factory and Department of Transportation, very, very male dominant mm -hmm. things and all that. And um, I, I was picking up on this issue about the difference in my relationships when I was the boss or when I was the subordinate. Mm -hmm. and, um, the, the, the question is, I mean, I had better relationships when I was the boss. And is it, is it, um, is it possible that being the boss, um, kind of, it, it, without the idea of threat, and not just about what can this woman do for me, whether being the boss um, kind of gives you the space, gave me the space to be, Competent and likable over time, and so that people, mm -hmm. my my subordinates, they had to sit there. I mean, they had to put up with me, kind of thing. And then again, if you if you kind of take out whether I was a, a good boss or a bad boss or mean or friendly, because I'm not. I'm not. A, I, I think I'm not the likable type, and I'm very directive. <laughs> um, but that I had the space when they were my subordinates. I had the space over time to both prove competence and likability. And, and there wasn't this immediate reaction. I mean, is that what happens? Well, well, it's, there's lots of opportunity for more research in this, so we don't know everything. But a couple <laughs> things we do know. One is that if you are in a position of formal authority, it's people treat female leaders more deferently than they do females. All right. So the formal authority position has an effect. It's absolutely true. The other thing is that um, the more you know someone, the less potent stereotypes are. So you're right. It does give you latitude. Uh, the problem is that you start with the contamination, and we know that there is a halo effect that, that contaminations can go. So it clearly puts women at a disadvantage. Okay, that's true. And then the other thing is that Alice Avery just completed a, a review of the literature on gender differences in transformational leadership, and women are more transformational as leaders. So, which is a, another form of I think communality in a way. It's inspirational leadership and leadership engaging the other. And so I think, um, I, it, what, what's the chicken and the egg? I don't know, are women going in and leading differently because of the pressures? My thought is yes. I think a woman who tries to go and lead in a traditional masculine form is going to get penalized. And it's gonna be socialized very quickly to learn not to do that. And it's gonna form other methods. It may turn out that using democratic leadership style and transformational leadership style and, in, certain, in many contexts, contemporary contexts of where you want lots of creative performance, for example, might be better actually. Might actually provide an advantage to female leaders. Um, but th why they do it initially is probably social pressure. I don't know. I think they are. I think you are socialized. I mean, I think of myself in the classroom, and I'm looking at my students' faces, and I know that if they're smiling and nodding, I mean, that's if you you know teaching you know that this is the case. They're smiling and nodding. You just want to roll. And if they're looking pained and aggravated, you just start just performing as well. You know, it's the same, it's the nature of like the interaction with the Confederates. When, they, when they're confronted with someone who's like showing all this hostility, it's hard to be a Confederate in that situation. I have to add one more um, stereotype um, because despite this evidence, this great evidence where I could go home and tell my husband, you know, I'm almost probably like that. <laughs> I mean, I find it very hard to, to ascribe some of my difficulty to this. Right. I still think it must have been me. Right. You know, I was doing something wrong, right? So. There you go. Yeah. Well, in terms of that, attributions that people make to, uh, to explain discrimination, it's very aversive to perceive yourself as personally a victim of discrimination. It's one thing to say, victimization occurs, it's horrible, I don't trust, it's awful, it happens at my institution, but to say, I have been victimized, is very aversive, and people don't want to do it. Yes? The design intervention to wash away these effects in the minds of the recipients, what does it look like? Would it be early childhood interventions, would it be interventions at the college level, would it be tinkering with the composition of the peer group, would it be exposing people to different leadership styles? I it would be having a lot of female leaders and a lot of men taking care of children. I think I could probably do it. Because these stereotypes grow out of, you know, what do we know men and women do? Men are competent because they're up there being leaders all the time. And women are the nurturers because they're home taking care of the kids. And even if women work, they're still home taking care of the kids. That hasn't changed. 
So if you want to change people's stereotypes and what they think is important, you know, if you want to be a good mommy, you have to be nurturing. That's what a good mommy is. But if, if daddies are now at home nurturing babies and kids, to be a good man, you have to be nurturing. And in fact, the gender stereotypes with this change, they're shrinking. So the answer is more women's a position of power and more men taking care of domestic you know, pursuits at home. Yeah. I think all of us probably have this experience in advising students. I mean, my overwhelming experience of this is that um, male and female students are roughly equally competent in terms of their mastery of the material. But taking two students who are roughly equally competent, uh, the female student is much more likely to verbalize um, worries about not knowing it well enough, not being able to do it, you know, worry that you know, this can't be all there is, there must be more than I'm supposed to know before I go out of here and try to do this. And male students are much more likely to assume that that's the way it's supposed to be, and you know, they've got it as well as anybody in the world to do it. And it seems to me it relates very directly to yeah. these assumptions and, and interpretations, but it's also partly how they wear it, it's how they present it to the world, which directly has an effect that you've observed in the influence. So I'm wondering, I've been sitting here throughout the discussion, okay, so what are we supposed to tell them? And one question is, what would we tell female students about how to become more influential? Which is a lot of what you've described. Mm -hmm. what's, the, what's the best balance of these things? What do you do? Which, I, which is a very interesting question. I want to actually, actually encourage you to flip the frame a little bit with it. Because as you describe these behaviors of women's and you put it in gender terms, women's patterns for how they interact and how they exert influence and why those are received or not received well. I've been hearing also, thinking about this in terms of the functional behaviors for problem solving within a group, and many of the behaviors that you described as being more influential, more likely to produce influence, are in my view also likely to produce worse answers by the group <laughs> as a whole. Mm -hmm. In other words, they're dysfunctional from the perspective of group problem solving. Now, I, I bring you this interest in crisis management, where everybody is intrinsically incompetent, because the nature of crisis is we haven't been through it before, so we know, we're making this up as we go along, that's the nature of the problem. Mm -hmm. And in that setting, it seems to me, the process of, of producing the best amalgam that we can of the available knowledge is really important. And the challenge of people being influential by seizing the floor and interrupting and all those kind of, I don't think I want to teach my women students to master the same dysfunctional <laughs> characteristics mm -hmm. that my male students had obviously mastered at age three and you know, practicing ever since. Um, so this worries me a lot. And, and what I want to ask you to think about is that it's been some very interesting development in starting with mediation about how to try to improve the overall group function. Mm -hmm. and the notion was, you know, it's often dysfunctional in the cockpit that somebody has authority and shouts down everybody else and tells everybody else to shut up and then flies a plane into a mountainside because they didn't know it was there. And one possibility is you change the behavior, you reduce the authority. But what they've actually been working on is trying to, to change the dynamic of the whole group, to, to try to change the so called crew resource management. And mm -hmm. the question is how you get the group to interact in a more positive way. And so it may be that we need to teach not the speaker, but the listeners. Uh, and to mm -hmm. think about your, what your work is suggesting in terms of retraining the group that's interacting with the influencer rather than the influencer herself. Right. Well, I mean, I think, you know, looking at group process and trying to relate it to these behaviors, you're right. I mean, I hope I wasn't suggesting that women should behave like you're men. Not. No, no, yes. Okay, because no. that, that I, that would not actually be a, a good thing, but um, generally, and there's there's kind of depends on what the context is. It depends on what the group is, but you know what the task is, whether there's a clear answer or not, um, whether it's a creative task or not. But generally speaking, for very creative kinds of tasks where you need lots of insight, then the more communal approach is actually better in groups. Yeah. So, which is kind of what you're saying. Um, I think. Teaching people what works is good, but also the problem is that when people get into a group interaction, there are several things going on. One is we do have to make a collective decision as group members, but also I'm here as me, and I'm here as, you know, I'm going to be ascendant and I'm going to take charge. I mean, I have my own personal motivations as well. So you have to make, somehow I think, make them feel very committed to the collective group experience or outcome more than, and, and even maybe their own personal success has to depend on that. And then they're much, going to be more likely to be reflective. I mean, I think there are going to be some people who are still 
going to want to take control. I mean, if you look at groups that composed entirely of men versus groups that composed entirely of women, male groups are much more hierarchical. They're much more. Um, there's one person who talks the most, and it breaks down. You know, second most, third most, very clearly. Um, women's groups are more egalitarian. Um, so if you could, you know, could mix gender groups. You don't want a single man. You want to encourage everybody to to focus on the group outcome. And that, yeah, maybe put in people who are, you know, the devil's advocates, deliberately saying, you know, we can't just take one point of view. My role is a devil's advocate. We have to consider different things. Everyone must speak. We have people who have the role of being social maintenance people. Yeah. In, so your, okay. in your research, and those that you've drawn upon, what account is taken of the realistic possibility that the men will exhort force and violence? Force and violence in what kind of context? Almost any. <laughs> From domestic abuse mm. to civic life. Mm -hmm. The boy kid will take the marker and hit the puppet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does, it does happen. I mean, we, <laughs> we, I've never had anyone become violent in my, in my research. I have, like, rude language. Um, well, let me say, as a, a, a boy growing up on the playgrounds of Los Angeles during World War II, mm -hmm. there were lots of gangs around. Oh, yeah. I found that my range of uh, possible reactions was very limited. I smiled right. a lot. I was very genial. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of things that you ascribed to women right. when, when I wasn't in a position to assert any other right. problems against dominant force. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's right. One of the real curiosities is you know, what's going on in the head of someone who's really dominant, kind of a bully type? What's going on in their heads? Because we know from research that what happens on the surface is that people comply with them to get away from them. So you get the bully, and the bully's pausing everyone around, and everybody says, okay, fine, whatever. I agree. And then they go silent and say, what a jerk. You know, and they hate this person. Is the bully oblivious to this? Does the bully care? I mean, there is research on bullies. Um, some, some evidence suggests that they are the more likely to misrepresent what's happened. And in children, for example, the bully type, this is research by Fago, this bully type who is actually turns out to be the least popular boy in the school is always pushing everybody around. They ask the kids to rate their popularity and rate their peers' popularity. And most of the kids are pretty on, on target. But you get this group of these bully boys, <laughs> and they think they're the most popular in the school. So somehow, because people overtly don't say, I loathe you, you're horrible, <laughs> nobody likes your behavior, they, and they see all this compliance, they feel, hmm, you know, they're not getting that message. Um, and in fact, the bully types do get surface, all sorts of surface stuff, and push people around and can feel good about that. But they are, in fact, loathed. I mean, so it's kind of a disconnect. But you may be dealing with a bully gender. I mean, it's not, it's not just those with... There are lots of nice men who are bullies. <laughs> lots of nice boys who are bullies. Yes. <laughs> the, uh, I was interested in the very last line of your very last slide. Okay. Which sort of concludes... Women have to be nice and confident. to be influential. Yeah. Uh, we've got to be incredibly confident. I know, isn't that not the normal? Yeah, I know. So when you send that message to, for example, undergraduate students, what, what do you, what do you, how do you accompany it? What, what is the? Well, first of all, what I think is very important because when I give, when I talk to organizations, often I get people angry at me because I, they're saying you're, it's not. Why are you telling me to do this? I don't want to do this. I said, don't do it. Do whatever you want. I'm not telling you what to do. This is not my recommendation because I think it's right. This is just what the research suggests. And what I tell my students is that you know that we haven't got all the advantages. I mean, they actually don't know this. They actually, at Wellesley particularly, they don't know this. Oh, I said that at the Kennedy School. They think everything is jolly. They're going to, yes. they're going to have everything. They're going to have a family. They're going to have a husband who does all the, the dishes, and he's going to clean the floors. He's That's going to earn right. a huge salary, and they're going to have lots of children. It's going to be fine. They're going to be the CEO of some organization, yeah, yeah. and on and on. They have no conception. So when I tell them, this is like a rude awakening to hear this. And I say, you know, you just have to make some realistic assessments of what's going to happen. I mean, Alice likes to say, pick a really nurturing partner. <laughs> Find a partner who'll nurture you if you want to be ascendant. Um, 
But I, you know, it's not happy news, and I can't say that I think this is good or I recommend it. I'm just saying that, you know, you need to know the situation exists. Wonderful. Thank you so much. This is really